is Histories and Mysteries Uncovered, and I'm Ashley. And I'm Jessica. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about the Paris catacombs. And I am going to be talking about the story of Dorothy Edie. Oh, I've never heard of her. It's very fascinating. It's Egypt related. So, Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um did you guys like our new name histories and mysteries uncovered (laughs) you may have seen our um some of our socials announcing it if you don't follow us you can hit us up at instagram or tiktok or um facebook which is where we made any of the announcements we just did there's another podcast called histories and mysteries and it was just difficult to navigate around that so we decided to go with histories and mysteries uncovered Real easy switch. You won't have to do anything. You can still listen to it in the same spot. You listen to it. Our socials are still the same. The only difference is when you recommend us to people, you will just tell them to look for Histories and Mysteries Uncovered. Yeah, super easy. Yeah. My uh, my buddy, Matthew, he did up our logo again for us. He updated it. He originally did it. And he updated it again for us, yeah. which is so nice. Yeah. So it's it's awesome. We're actually we're we're super excited for it. Yeah. Just some uh, fun new things. Yeah. And then we have the stickers and the thank you cards coming out to our they were in the mail yesterday. Yay! So they should be getting to you soon. Well, thank you everybody that's following us. So last week or the week before we were talking about those that joined um alexandra and terry yeah and then now we also have valerie yes so thank you and my husband yeah i saw that i was like oh we got a fourth and i was like oh it's kyle i don't know if that counts (laughs) (laughs) i kind of bullied him into it i'm like excuse me (laughs) i have some really cool stories for my bonus episode and you're not even gonna hear it listen (laughs) My husband doesn't listen anyway, so lame. Mine does. He doesn't listen to podcasts at all, and he doesn't listen. To, he's not into true crime or like paranormal or yeah. really historical stories too much. Podcasts just aren't his jam. That's okay. They're not yeah. for everybody. He follows but, us though. I know he's so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but my uh, my mom was just listening to our Ant Hill cult. Oh yeah, episode, and she was like, uh, "Nope." <laughs> I did not need to ride on that train with you with you. Yeah. Yeah. That was so that was bad. <laughs> it was horrible. So my story this week's really cool. My story's um eerie. So oh. but it's not horrific. Mine's <laughs> supernatural in a sense. Ooh. But only if you believe in the kind of stuff I'm gonna talk about. So oh, okay. Yeah. So, anyways, tell you about the Paris Catacombs. Okay. We watched that movie. I know. So, I'm going to reference yeah. it in here. Okay, but good. <laughs> one of my fa- – so, my absolute favorite scary movie is 13 Ghosts. Never seen it. Oh, it's good. I'm a big Matthew Lillard fan. Oh, I love him. He's in it. Um, I don't know. There's something about him I really like. And, like – in this role he plays, he's a he's like a psychic, and he's kind of sexy. But anyway, it's really good. You should watch it. Have you ever seen Without a Paddle? No, I haven't. Because it's like one of my favorite stupid comedy movies. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm not like super into that kind of humor, but I love it. That movie is the best. Yeah. Without well, a it's... Paddle and Super Troopers. <laughs> I do like Super I like Grandma's Boy, too never seen it oh that's a good one because it's not really my humor alley oh yeah 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 so like i don't really like the gross humor it's not gross it's dumb it's stupid yeah but anyways him and without a paddle was great i haven't seen and i also surprised everybody's gonna yell at me for that i'm not like a true horror movie fan i haven't seen him in scream i haven't seen any of the scream movies i don't think i've ever watched them in their entirety I'm not a huge like chase you around slasher 
type movie fan. I, yeah. That's just not really what I enjoy. So that's why I've never seen him. But, you know, he's from, I mean, <laughs> spoiler alert, he is the screen <laughs> guy. Like, he's the murderer. And so I, I think I would like seeing him in that. But anyway, 13 goes my favorite. My second favorite movie is As Above, So Below, which takes place in the Paris catacombs. Yes. Which I've also been very to. Very creepy. Yes, I love it. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's got... um. Ashley made me watch it. Oh, wasn't it good? It wasn't as scary as I thought it was going to be, but like it was creepy. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And it's got um that actor in it from Superstore, and I really like him. He was also in Drop Dead Diva, if yes. anybody has seen that. Yes, he played the little angel. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> That's where I first him. fell in love with him. Me too! I love him! He's so cute! Yeah. Anyway, he's in it. He plays a really good guy in that one, too. Aww. Um, but I also have been to the Paris catacombs. Have you just? No. I can't remember. Okay. I've been to Paris, but the catacombs were not on the itinerary for some oh. stupid reason. Okay. So we went, it was, when I went to Paris, it was the hottest week of their summer. Um, the whole city smelled like urine, uh, because it was so hot. Everything was just like baking. So we decided one, cause they're cool. And two, they're cool. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <sighs> anyway, so they were cool in temperature and cool in. They were cool. fascinating. Yeah. So we decided to go into them, and they really are interesting. So, uh, I got my resources from Parisian Field Catacomb, like the actual catacombs tourist website um jstor daily so if you are a any type of college student you have used jstor for any scholarly article yes yeah apparently yeah. they have a daily like magazine or whatever they put out so i use one of their articles oh cool and then i use something called spooked and the guardian okay sweet so the Paris catacombs are such a unique place and they date all the way back to the ancient, ancient Roman times. Um, back then this area was heavily, heavily, um, uh, <laughs> back then this area had a ton of limestone. Wow. <laughs> This is going great. <laughs> it had a ton of limestone and it was heavily mined. That's where I wanted to say the heavily. And then when I messed it up, I didn't know how to come back from that. So, uh, <laughs> and this limestone actually helped to build the town of Paris. They mined it um, almost to completion, like almost to empty. And then they just left. They just left them. They never did maintenance on them. They just left these like pretty much empty tunnels underneath this new city Paris. And after several years uh, and centuries of these caves being abandoned, they started collapsing at random. One of the articles said that Paris was a city built on air because it's oh. just these empty caves that they're built on. Weird. And in 1774, there was a bunch of cave-ins on Rue d'Enfer, which literally translates to street from hell. Oh. Um, they quote was a sound of giant heaving, a great sigh and stretching, like he's stretching his limbs. So it's like, this is the sound that it made. It was like uh, along yeah. the Eastern side of the Rue d'Enfer for what proved to be a quarter of a mile. And this sound was basically the ground like collapsing in oh wow so it uh collapsed in a quarter of a mile and swallowed up all of these houses that were in this area wow at this point they called it the mouth of hell and king louis the 16th created a project to strengthen the underground tunnels because he couldn't just have you know his city collapsing and so they went under and they were trying to reinforce these tunnels while they were doing this, like kind of at the same time, the cemeteries in Paris were overflowing due to more and more people moving from the country to the city. There was a cemetery there called the Holy Innocents. 
And it was the oldest burial ground in Paris dating back to 1186. Wow. Yeah. So this one was super, super full. I mean, that's years and years and years of burying people there. And one of the earlier Kings had the cemetery enclosed by a large wall to quote, give pop proper respect to the dead and limit its use as commons and separate it from market activities. But as the city got bigger and bigger, this kind of didn't happen and things were lines were kind of blurred and there was activities going on in the cemetery and kind of out of the cemetery and the buying and selling of different like goods kind of happened in the cemetery. There was like some illicit trade and like <laughs> they said general debauchery. Uh, and Sounds like a grand time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And they formed like, like a, I don't know what that was supposed to say. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do have to say though. Yes. That. So you were talking about King Louis. Yes. In the 1700s. It just, it it like <laughs> it's so hard to wrap my brain around the fact that king louis was interested in the infrastructure of his city yeah i don't know why that's so, like why that's so hard for me to get around my head you know what was hard for me <laughs> the 1100 <laughs> <laughs> that and i thought king louis was like way way back in history like the fact that he yeah. was king into the 1800s shocked me like when america was being born he was yeah king. he was king yeah. like i have zero knowledge of the history of france like zero my only knowledge from the history of france comes from the cw show rain which i loved <laughs> <laughs> sure it was not super accurate no <laughs> so just the thought of like i don't know when i thought of like king louis any of them because i'm sure there's more than one i was thinking back in like 14 1500s you know and no he was like into the 1800s it's crazy yeah there was more than one <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, he was the 16th so <laughs> so there's maybe there was one a before him <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> All right, continue. It just, yeah, it was just, yeah. I don't know why it was just so weird for me to like get my head around that. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, okay, so this was a quote. It said, The vast necropolis of saints' innocence, so the cemetery, welcomed the dead from every parish in the city. Human decomposition mixed with the blood and guts of the market, with piles of rubbish to form a putrid stench, a dangerous affluence that made La Halle's an access of infection and disease. The Black Plague. <laughs> and I think there were like two or three, I didn't write this down, but I'm, I think I read that there were like two or three um grave ten uh grave attendants that died from like the disease and like stench and like all that kind of stuff happening. Ew. And because of this crowding, they actually stopped burying people there in 1780. But in like right after they decided to kind of stop doing that in 1780, a restaurateur living uh right next to that cemetery. So I guess like he had a wall that like butt butted up to the cemetery. He went to retrieve some bottles of wine from his cemetery and the smell like overwhelmed him. Sorry. What? He went to go retrieve bottles of wine from his cemetery or his cellar? Definitely cellar. <laughs> Definitely okay. cellar. You don't get wine from a cellar. I mean, I guess you could get wine from a cellar. I was like, wow, but... is this like an illegal business? <laughs> No, from his right cellar. <laughs> Does he have a speakeasy <laughs> in a cemetery? Oh gosh. Oh. Um. So for, yes, from his cellar, which probably makes it a little bit more weird that he smelled this horrible smell. Yes. Okay. 
And he discovered that the walls of a mass grave adjacent to his house had burst open and sent a ton of corpses into his basement. Yeah. So at this point, they're like, we got to do something like this is this is too much. Can you Um, even imagine? No. Walking into your cellar and finding dozens of corpses corpses rotting corpses that smelled like that's what first drew drew his attention was how bad the smell was onto your floor yeah how horrifying so they're finally like okay we gotta do something about this so between 1785 and 1787 at night they moved all the bodies from the cemetery to these underground tunnels And as time went on, they added more and more bodies to the tunnels. They actually estimate at this point, there's about 6 million bodies down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they just kind of laid there just like that until um, the early 1800s when Inspector Herakart de Thury decided to create the elaborate walls and formations and altars that we see today. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I couldn't figure out like why he did it. He just, he just did it. He was like, Hey, this will be pretty. He did it. Um, and in 1809, the tunnels first opened up to tourists. 1809. 1809. Holy shit. Yeah. I just, Um, I was, I don't Just the fact that why were no other places being overrun with bodies. Like there are other places that have millions of people needing to be buried in the ground. I think because Paris is one such a huge city and it wasn't there. Like it got built up. So all these people were coming from the country to the city as this huge city was getting built up. And I think that's kind of what it was like an influx of people. But like England doesn't have catacombs does it there's a lot of places that have catacombs i didn't realize really yeah yeah like there's some in africa uh, i know in savannah they don't have catacombs but they had like mass graves so like when you're walking down sidewalks and stuff you're more than likely walking on graves because they like did them underground yuck yeah that's wild yeah yeah, Holy if you ever look, if you just Google catacombs instead of like Paris catacombs, there's quite a few that'll come up. I had no idea. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, so, that's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So above the entrance, when you walk into the Paris catacombs, like where you're allowed to first walk in, because the, the tourist area of the catacombs is quite small in comparison to how big the catacombs actually are. And they have one entrance that you go into, like you can't enter and enter in all these different places. There's one entrance for tourists and above it in French, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. (laughs) It says, stop. This is the empire of death. (laughs) Yes. That's the first word. Yeah. Say. Lampier. Demorier. ICI. Oh, EC. Arret, say, EC, la empire de la mort. Ta da! I speak French. Um, <laughs> you don't even know how to pronounce EC, <laughs> which is here. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the history. And now we're going to get into some creepy stories. Okay. So. They think that this next story is kind of the basis for the movie As Above, So Below, which we talked about in the beginning here. In the early 1990s, there was a group of cataphiles, that's they're called. So these are people that are super interested in the catacombs, and they'll go in and out as they please in different areas. So if you've ever seen the movie As Above, So Below, the people that the main characters seek out to get them into the catacombs, they would be cataphiles. So they're just like super into it. They go, they'll go in and out as they please from different areas. Like they don't take the main tourist entrance. They go wherever they want. A lot of times they're saying they'll bring like furniture down. 
they'll bring decorations down to like claim a spot down there and like hang out. I don't know. Um, so anyway, so yeah. <laughs> so some cataphiles were walking through some of the chambers of bone and skull when they found a video camera all alone sitting on the floor. Ew. The camera had been recorded on and what they found was terrifying. The video was a point of view video. I saw it. I watched it on YouTube and um, it was so like whoever was holding it, he was reporting what he was seeing and he was looking at bones and he would pick up a skull and kind of look at it and put it down. But then as he's going through, he kind of starts to get scared and you can tell that he's lost. He couldn't figure out how to get out. He apparently based on some of the structures that they saw in the video, uh, they could tell that he was pretty deep into the catacombs and eventually he starts to get really scared and starts running and he starts breathing really heavy at the very end. He drops the camera in some water and runs off and the camera just continues to record until the battery dies. A group tried to go into the catacombs to find him or his body. No one ever found him. So they don't know if maybe he made it out or if he died down there. Um, We may never know. But there is an urban legend that says that after midnight in the catacombs, voices will tempt you deeper and deeper until you can no longer find your way out. So is this what happened to him? Oh, gross. Why would you ever go in there by yourself? I don't know. Uh, there's another legend down there from the ghost of Philibert Asperit. Um, during the French Re- Revolution, Philibert was a doorman at a hospital and he was tasked with retrieving some liquor from the cellar. And I saw like two different articles. One said that he accidentally ended up in the catacombs and one said he was there on purpose. Um, there's a passage from the hospital to the catacombs. So either he like accidentally somehow walked into there, like not paying attention, or he went in there on purpose. I, I'm not sure. I saw two different things on it. But so the one story said because it was an accident, he didn't have any light on him. And the one story said that he went there on purpose, but he only brought one candle with him. So either way, he he ran out of light or didn't have light. Um And because of this, he got lost in the tunnels and he never saw the light of day again. 11 years later, they found his body and they knew it was him because he had a very specific key to the hospital that they found on his body. They buried him in the catacombs and he is now said to be the protector of the cataphiles who pay their respects to his grave. Each November 3rd, it is said that the ghost comes out and haunts the galleries of the catacombs. And then the last story I have is actually what made me want to do this story. And it was recommended by my dad based on this story. This is so creepy. Okay. Okay. So in 2004, a group of police officers were inspecting the catacombs. They generally do that. There's like a group of police officers that go through and one look for like destruction and graffiti and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, another one, another mission is to, you know, look for, to make sure things are still okay down there. So they were going through, they were doing a training exercise and they found a tarp and on the tarp, there was a sign that said building site, no access behind that in the tunnel was a desk that had a TV camera set up to start recording when it detected motion. There was also a um, PA system that would start playing the sound of a dog barking when it detected motion. So like if you walked by, it would record you and play the song sound of dog barking to like scare people off, I guess. Ew. After further inve- investigation, they found 3000 square feet of galleries wired for phone lines using pirated electricity that seemed to be professionally installed. There were swastikas painted on the ceiling, but there was also a Celtic cross and stars of David. So they don't think it was like one like hate group or something like that. They also found a stocked bar with tables and chairs and a pressure cooker. Like it was like a little restaurant, a living room type of layout, a workshop, a lounge, 
and a movie room big enough to fit about 20 people. What? Yeah. The seats of the movie theater had been carved into the stone of the catacomb, and they found a movie projector, a full-size cinema screen, and um, the movies there were both old and new. So they knew it was like recently people had been down there. Um, they also found cameras on the ceiling that seemed to be recording them. So they left and they went to go get um, like a bigger team. And um, I think they took some like electricians down there with them to see, you know, how this is happening. When they went down there a few days later, everything was gone. The phone lines were cut. The electricity was cut. All of the furniture was gone. The projection screen, everything was gone. What? All that was left was a piece of paper in the middle of the room (gasps) that said, no, sure, pa, or do not seek. Yeah. They have never found this group. They have no idea who it is. But they had this like huge elaborate thing. That's and crazy. Disappeared and left a note that said, "Do not seek us out." Ew! Isn't that insane? Yeah. So that is my Paris catacomb story. Oh, and I'm sorry, my mouth is so dry. I'm pretty sure I have like gross mouth noises on the microphone right now. <laughs> I apologize. Go get some water. <laughs> like seriously i don't know why it's so dry all of a sudden but okay i tell us about your lady okay (laughs) okay you didn't even really like we didn't really talk about as above so below but that's no, okay. I just that one part where they think that that was the story that it got its yeah. like, idea from. So creepy. Yeah. So Movie's creepy. really good. If you haven't seen it, go look, go watch it, everyone. It's great. It's fine. You shut up. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so on that note. <laughs> I got my sources from Mm medium.com, ancient origins, and egyptianstreets.com. Oh. And probably all that's interesting. I would think. (laughs) I don't know, though. (laughs) I don't remember. (laughs) Honestly, I don't think I did, actually. I'm surprised. I'm shocked. I know. Anyways, Dorothy Eater. So, Ashley. Yes. I've got a historical puzzler for you. Okay. She was a well-known Egyptologist from the 20th century. Mm -hmm. She had always insisted that she was the reincarnation of an Isis priestess. And she appeared to have firsthand knowledge to support this claim. She even had knowledge of information that was unpublished and not made public. Well, of course she did. She was a researcher. No, I'll get into it. Okay. I'm very skeptical. I know. I'm not. But you can be. (laughs) It's fine. Irish parents gave Edie life in London in 1904, and at the age of three, her life changed. She was knocked unconscious at that point after falling headfirst down a flight of stairs in her house. Oh, geez. Reports differ on what actually happened after it. Some claim that she was declared dead before abruptly waking up. And others contend that she only had an uncommon form of brain damage, like foreign accent syndrome. Oh, okay. Whatever the reason or whatever happened afterwards, the fall changed her for good. And she had altered her speech patterns for starters. And then she continued to ask her parents to take her home. Mm -hmm. 
The girl was unable to respond when asked where home was. And unsurprisingly, her parents were super confused. During the first year after her accident, her parents took her to see an Egyptian display at the British Museum. Her story really starts to get strange at this point because it stated that as she was perusing the artifacts, she yelled out, there's my home and pointed to a picture. How old was she? Uh, Four. Okay. The temple of Seti I, Ramses the Great's father, appeared in the image. She was adamant that she had once lived in that identical structure, but she soon realized that something was missing. Where are the trees in the gardens? She asked. Supposedly, Dorothy skipped merrily through the Egyptian exhibits in the museum. Same. (laughs) kissing kissing the statue's feet and declaring that she was now among her people and she's four Mm -hmm. naturally her parents were against this conversation but as she got older the child started going to the exhibits as frequently as she could she eventually attracted the interest of renowned Egyptologist E.A. Wallace Budge, who urged her to study hieroglyphics. But she had a difficult adolescence. For instance, one Sunday school teacher requested her parents keep her at home due to her propensity to draw comparisons between Christianity and Egyptian paganism. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. She was also expelled from the girls' school she attended because she refused to sing a hymn that begs God to curse the swart Egyptians. Oh. She is even alleged to have thrown the hymnal at her teacher before leaving the classroom in a rage. (laughs) Oh, shit. Yeah. (laughs) Even attending Catholic church, which by all accounts she truly loved, had to be abandoned. An enraged priest visited her home after she said that it reminded her of the old religion of the pharaohs. She was informed by him that she was no longer welcome in his church. Oh, poor little thing. Yeah. As she grew older, her obsession with ancient Egypt only intensified. She first talked about her... Yes. (laughs) <laughs> sorry <laughs> she first talked about her first incident with Seti the first when she was 14 years old they had sex people <gasps> she also revealed images of nightly visitations in which his mummy appeared to her bedside and t- and tore away her nightdress <gasps> a girl been watching some naughty videos she claimed to have been his lover in a past life how old was she at this point in like real life yeah uh i think she was like 13 14 okay The girl was passionately obsessed with her nighttime experiences, and she wasn't scared of them. Oh, all right. When Dorothy's parents ran out of options, they sent her to a succession of sanatoriums. Everything failed. She simply wouldn't give up her beliefs. And when she was 16, she permanently stopped attending school. Oh. Her schooling, however, was far from over. In Plymouth, where her father had an early cinema theater, she started taking evening classes at an art college. She was given the chance to perform as Isis here, which was a character that she had a strong affinity to. So, Dorothy used this time to figure out the specifics of her past experience. She claimed that over the course of a year-long series of visits, midnight manifestations of the god Hora dictated it to her. She wrote a book, people. Dorothy, who claimed to be the reincarnation of a child named 
I'm going to butcher this because I could not find a pronunciation for it. And it's ancient Egyptian, so bear with me. Her name was Ben Trishis. Wait. Ben Trishit. No. <laughs> How do you spell it? I want to try. B E N T R E S H Y T. Oh, gosh. Bentrished. Bentrished. Uh, that's a hard one. Ben. Ben. Bentrished. 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 I don't even know, man. Bentrished. Anyways, we're going to call her Ben. <laughs> okay. Claimed to have been abandoned when she was three years old and to have grown up in the Seti the First Temple at Abydos, the identical structure she had pointed out when she was four years old. She talked about meeting the pharaoh while working as an Isis priestess in the temple grounds. However, losing one's virginity while a priestess of Isis was a crime punishable by death. Ben was made to appear in court after becoming pregnant with Seti's child, but she opted to die by suicide instead. Oh my. When she started writing for an Egyptian magazine in London at the age of 27, that was when the next crucial phase of her life began. She first met Imam Abdel Megwid there, and they later got married. She gave birth to a son while they were living in Cairo, and she gave him the name Seti in honor of her long-lost pharaoh lover and adopted the Arabic name Om Seti, which meant mother of Seti. I wonder how her husband felt <laughs> about her wanting to name their son after an old lover. Yeah. I don't know. I would not be happy about that if uh, Cody had come to me and been like, I want to name uh, Mara after my ex. I'd be like, um, excuse me? Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, though, he was a powerful ruler as well. So. No, I don't think I'd like it still. <laughs> <laughs> but as Ashley has been pointing out, things were not simpler for her in Cairo. <laughs> She had married into a wealthy family, and they were super offended by her accounts of pharaonic apparitions and outer body experiences. Yeah, maybe at that point, just keep it to yourself, lady. <laughs> she would get up in the middle of the night, unresponsive and trance-like, to scribble oh. down pages and pages of hieroglyphics, sharp lines, and fast thoughts that were nearly unintelligible to anybody but Om Seti. The marriage ultimately ended in divorce after only two short years, at which point Imam moved to Iraq. In any case, Om Seti was obviously more in love with Egypt than she was with her husband, so she stayed in Egypt. She continued raising her son and working for the National Department of Antiquities. She authored a number of books and papers during her tenure there, which are still highly regarded even today. Hmm. But she also terrified a lot of people, especially <laughs> the locals. Okay. Because she had a reputation for spending lonely nights inside the Great Pyramid of Giza or making offerings at the Sphinx's feet. <sighs> That's weird. Yeah. People were alarmed by these rites, which made her the target of considerable rumors. She was also greatly appreciated for being so honest about her opinions, which is a strange paradox. Yeah. <laughs> like a yeah. little, little hypocritical there. Yeah. Om Seti, who was in her 40s, was unexpectedly granted the chance to work alongside excavators in Abydos. She naturally jumped at the chance. After all, the area she had pointed out as a young child in the British Museum was the one where her and her lover had first fallen in love. But it's like, were you guys in love or did he just like take advantage of you because you were a child? Oh. 
so <laughs> like i'm looking at you like are <laughs> words gonna come out of your mouth <laughs> lots of thoughts happening so the king or whatever who was her lover her pharaoh. god was it a king yeah. or a god a pharaoh a yeah that's pharaoh. It. we're talking about egypt pharaoh <laughs> yes um so the pharaoh that had the sexy times with her yes she was 14 yeah now was she 14 in her past life too yeah or just in this life and when she was getting life. the visits no in her past life she was 14 when she okay that um okay. i believe yeah okay and then in her nowadays life she's also she's in 14 her when she's he in her 40s her yeah right, but now but now like when she's he's, in her 40s okay but when he was coming to her bed at night she was 14 yeah okay okay that's when it started gotcha yes she proved to be an excellent resource for researchers in abydos she also assisted them in finding the remains of the gardens she had long ago described it's so like she's helping actually find shit hmm. the conversation she had with the head inspector of egypt's antiquities department who took her to seti's temple and put her claims to the test was even more bizarre he spoke to her while they were both in complete darkness about a collection of wall paintings. He asked her to move towards that specific mural after describing it in detail, and she performed it flawlessly. The inspector was shocked, as one might expect. These paintings' locations had never been made public. Hmm. Do you have thoughts? Where were they for these paintings? In Abydos at that temple that she said that she grew up in. So how did he know where they were? Well, because he was an inspector and he had been working at the site for, for a long time. So people did know yeah, where these like, paintings were. He did, yeah. So but probably like, other people too. Not unless you had been working at the site. Yeah. So, like, people who worked at the site would know. Yeah, but nobody else was there in the room with them, and he was describing, like, a random wall. But there was a possible way for her to know if she had possibly talked to someone else who worked there. Oh, my God. You're impossible. <laughs> She also described other research. I'm ignoring you. She also <laughs> described how the prayers and customary rites went, even before she studied many religious papyri. Papyri? I don't know. Like, I always thought it was papyrus, but like, just looks like papyri. I don't know. Maybe that's a singular. Hmm. Um. Anyways, even before she studied anything, she was familiar with the stories. Excavations have frequently verified her accounts of the monuments, reliefs, and other objects she saw in her past life. Many Egyptologists also were unable to refute what she said. Experts who had spent a lot of time working in Egypt did not have her knowledge. Kenneth Kitchen, a well-known British Egyptologist, is one of them. He may not have wanted to say it out loud, but the evidence in the written sources indicates that he trusted her. Additionally, Nicholas Reeves considered her visions when looking for Nefertiti. This part. <laughs> this part. Okay. If you are not convinced, you're out of my life. <laughs> okay. Okay. She claimed that the tomb of Nefertiti is located in the Valley of the Kings. Okay. 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 She said... I did once ask his majesty where it was, and he told me. He said, why do you want to know? I said I would like to have it excavated, and he said, no, you must not. We don't want anything more of this family known. But he did tell me where it was, and I can tell you this much. It's in the Valley of the Kings, and it's quite near to the Tutankhamun tomb. But it's in a place where nobody would ever think of looking for it. She laughed and said it's apparently still intact. And if 
we remember from my King Tut story, I had mentioned that recently they were under the assumption that Nefertiti's tomb was in King Tut's pyramid and was in a secret tunnel that they just found. So they did find Nefertiti. They found a chamber. I don't know how far they've gotten, but I'm just saying they think that it's hers. They think it's where she is. I just think it's like... No? I mean, if they had found her, they're sure, but they haven't found her, so it's oh my still f- be a bunch of bullshit. Oh, my fucking... <laughs> They haven't found her. Oh, my God. (laughs) Her statements have also led to a lot of discoveries. Uh, They found tomb KV-63 in the Valley of the Kings, which is close to Tutankhamun's tomb, and housed female mummies from the 18th dynasty. Oh. She also spent the remainder of her days in Abydos, where she was a great help to the frequent visitors who were archaeologists and researchers. But the major reason she stayed was that she claimed the location gave her a sense of calm. She thought she was atoning for Ben's transgressions. Working with researchers was only an added bonus. Hmm. But there was no denying her contributions to Egyptology, Ashley. She was an expert in the nearby ruins and had a supernatural mastery of hieroglyphics. She also made an appearance in the National Geographic film, Egypt, Quest for Eternity, (laughs) which was released the year that she passed away and had a suitable title for someone who believed in reincarnation. Despite her numerous studies on historical folk practices and other contributions to Egyptology, Om Seti was still feared by the locals. She knew no Christian or Muslim cemeteries would accept her when she passed away at the age of 77. Aww. Or in her 80s, there were like varying sources about gotcha. this. Um, that being the case, she started to build her own tomb in her backyard garden. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted a concrete slab topped underground chamber, of course. However, at the last second... Health authorities stepped in and insisted that she be given a proper funeral. She was finally granted an undesired site in the dry desert by a nearby Coptic cemetery, but there was to be no monument above her tomb, and it would have to be a mountain of stones. That's sad. You know, it's like, oh, stop doing what you're doing. We're going to give you an undesirable location. With a pile of rocks. Well, and I mean, despite what you think is the reason why she knew this stuff, she helped with the research a lot. Like she dedicated her life to these this research and these discoveries and stuff. And it's sad that she didn't even get any like memorial, like monument or anything above her grave, you know? Yeah, I know. A truly (laughs) or A truly extraordinary life came to an unceremonious end with her anonymous burial. Some 40 years later, efforts are still being made to refute her allegations. Those who disagree believe Om Seti obtained unpublished materials and utilized them to deceive people. And yes, it is tempting, Ashley, to write her off as another opportunistic con artist However, we should also keep in mind that <laughs> Hamlet that Hamlet tells Horatio in Shakespeare's play, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So. Well, Hamlet is also not real. Um, Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first F-bomb you've dropped on this podcast. <laughs> no because i usually say what the fuck <laughs> oh, that's sorry i just like <laughs> so passionate about it no okay so 
here's my thoughts. I was so excited to share this story with you. you... <laughs> you. Do you want to know my thoughts? Okay, fine. Fuck. Okay. I... I don't not believe in reincarnation. I was going to say, we're waiting. Like, and, <laughs> I, <you know. laughs> I like to think that seems like a pretty nice way to have an afterlife is reincarnation if you choose to do so. Um, do I believe that she was reincarnated? Maybe. Uh, do I think it's more likely that she was just super into Egypt? Maybe. Although the one thing I can't get past is when she was a little kid and I was going to ask you See? who, like, were these stories corro- corro- blah, blah, corroborated by other people or was it just her saying that she said this stuff? No, her parents. Did her parents say it though? Or did she yeah. say my parents said this? No, okay. her parents did. And then they like sent her to mental institutions because of it. But did she just say that? Or did that actually happen? I'm not entertaining you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think maybe I could be convinced if I... I mean, it doesn't matter what I think, but I think maybe I could be convinced if I had seen like the research she did that other people didn't know, maybe like got more into more in depth with that, maybe. But is that I don't a know. challenge? <laughs> so you're 100 percent convinced she is reincarnated lady from Egypt. Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, I definitely think that I don't, like I said, I don't not, not believe in reincarnation. I know it's a double negative, but you know what I'm saying? Um, I just don't know. Like, why would, why would she remember her whole life? Well, like I said, like a lot of it came to her in her dreams, right? Yeah. But then why wouldn't we all remember our past lives well she did have a traumatic brain injury but a lot of people have that i guess some of them turn out to be serial killers (laughs) (laughs) so at least she didn't do that right i don't know i think we are we're also not tapped into our supernatural side right like yeah yeah i mean like why are some people psychic and some are i guess is you know same type of exactly like there's people out there that even today that remember their past lives but yeah yeah okay I mean, those of us that don't and the only the only reason i want to counteract what you're saying is because like i was that kid that was obsessed with ancient egypt since uh-huh. i was like five years old mm-hmm. and i never once said oh i was a priestess that had sex with a pharaoh like you know like i never I always joke, like, yeah, yeah, like, I totally lived in, like, ancient Egypt. <laughs> and see, I would believe that more but, likely, that just, like, you're super into the culture, and, like, you love ancient Egypt, so you're like, yeah, I, I would probably lived in Egypt. I'd be like, yeah, you probably did. Yeah. But for some reason, this lady has, like, too many details. I'm like, hmm. Well, and that's, <laughs> that's the thing, though, because, like, when she was that little, like, she wouldn't have known about that stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. But that's and- the thing. And the the whole, I don't know, man, the the him coming to her bed at night when she's like 14, to me, seems more like she was being sexually abused in some way. And that's how she channeled that. <laughs> that face. Sorry. I know I took it down a much darker path. So, did she have DID at that point, right? Because with DID, a lot of it is, you know, they were sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And then that's how their separate personalities kind of come out to protect them. Well, I don't know necessarily that I think she had like a separate personality. I just think that maybe 
she had convinced herself that that's what was happening or kind of like had a fantasy that that's what was happening instead of what was actually happening. But But what if she did? That's just a dark. No, the whole DID thing is like a good theory. And then like, you know, she has these different personalities that come out and one of them is like, oh yeah, I'm a priestess. Because you know how people with DID have like not even different personalities, but different genders different beliefs yeah you know, they've had like each. different like blood pressures and yeah yeah respiration rates and stuff so yeah. interesting yeah i mean That's do i so think it's sad. impossible if you brought it that way <laughs> i mean like i said do i think it's impossible no do i think it's probable hmm hmm but i like that you think it is because that's very like like I want it to be that, you know, like yeah. fun and supernatural and cool. Yeah, and you're like, oh, she was sexually assaulted. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Such a bad person. <laughs> like fuck. <laughs> That's where my thought. Like, if if I had like a 13 or 14 year old that came to me and said that, that would be my first thought. Like, see, and my thought was the fact that it was like that's when she fell in love with seti when she was 14 and so when she turned 14 in this life that's kind of when her memories started solidifying and things just started that yeah. happening you that's know? happier i like that better me too yeah <laughs> yeah well i don't know what you guys think too on this uh hit us up on any of our socials or whatever what do you guys think do you think that she was really a former egyptian uh what was she in a, not a print not she wasn't a princess a- but priestess a priestess or do you think it was just a a lady that that had some mental health issues oh do you have jokes for me i do have jokes okay what are they what do dentists call their x-rays i don't know what toothpicks (laughs) i like that a lot did you hear about the first restaurant to open on the moon? It didn't have an atmosphere. Yeah, it had great food, but no atmosphere. <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> so stupid. Why do ducks have feathers? Why? To cover their butt quacks. (laughs) (laughs) I like that one a lot. I have one for you. Okay. (laughs) What do you call a bundle of hay in a church? A hoedown? A Christian bale? (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. well if you want more of us lovely ladies you can find us on facebook instagram tiktok and youtube and you can join our patreon our first bonus episode will be dropping june 30th yay, yay. and if you want to rate and review us you can do so on apple podcast and spotify Yay. Well, thanks for listening and we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week. Bye. Bye.